Everybody good today? Turn to somebody, tell them that you're glad that they're here. Uh, even if they're not glad they're here, tell them you're glad uh, that they're here today. Uh, what a great day uh, to be together as we uh, begin to move towards uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our series in just a second. But before we do that, I want to point us uh, to 2023 since Rocky's already done that. Uh, it's his fault. Uh, it's coming. And one of the things we're doing is we're already beginning to plan for what God will do here at Christ United in 2023. And one of the big areas we need your help with is in our next-gen ministries, our children's and youth ministry. We're beginning the process of recruiting people to serve uh, with our kids, and with our youth. We need uh, you to consider and to pray about how God might use you either on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night. We know we're going to need folks to teach from five-year-olds all the way up through youth. Uh, We need people to do things from being in classes uh, to to doing hospitality. So if you can say good morning, any of you out there good enough at that, you can work in children's ministry. So I've got the, I think I've got the uh, address up there for you. Go ahead and write that. It's real hard to forget. Next gen at, uh, at ChristUnitedJackson.org. Shoot an email and say, hey, I'm interested. Let me know, uh, let me know what this might look like. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love uh, to put you in a place where God, uh, God has already created for you uh, to serve. We'd love for you to step into that as we move into 2023. We're in the second week of Advent, and Advent's a season uh, where we wait. It's not just a season where we rush to Christmas. It's a season where we wait for God to speak, where we remember again that Christ comes to us, God in the flesh, as we sang about a little bit ago. We have a a book, a study book, if you'd like this outside. Some of you grabbed it. It's a great place if you want to take notes. We've got study questions you can go through at home during the week. Uh, There there are study questions even for your kids. So if you've got kids at home, uh, some books, some places there for them to answer questions and do some coloring and drawing, a great resource for the whole family. Our, Our scripture today is taken from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Isaiah is the prophet in the Old Testament who does more to point to Jesus, to the Messiah, to the Savior, than any other prophet. So every week during this season of Advent, we're going to hear him point to Jesus, the Messiah. And in chapter 11, he's, uh, Isaiah is talking to a group of people who are in the middle of war and turmoil and pain and chaos. And this is what he says to them. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what the eyes see or decide by what ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor And decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist. And faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. And then on that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him. And his dwelling shall be glorious. Let's pray. God, it's so strange to talk about waiting, about pausing, especially in this season. There's so much to do. We travel, we go places. Christmas parades and Christmas parties, presents to buy, places to be, families to contact. But God, allow this place, this morning and in the weeks ahead, to be a place of sanctuary and retreat where you can do your work in us to prepare us to receive again 
the good news of Jesus. God, remove from us this morning any distractions that we might have, that we might hear from you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So this morning, we want to start by talking about stumps. I think we've got a picture of a stump in case you're not familiar with what a stump looks like. Some of you are thinking, you know, I woke up this morning thinking I'd like Eddie to talk about stumps this morning, right? Well, this is your lucky day. I'm going to talk about stumps because here's what we all know about stumps. Nobody cares about stumps, right? You don't care about them. I don't care about them. All they do is they represent a tree that once was, a tree that is no more, a tree that is dead. Here's how much we don't care about stumps. How many of you landscaped your yard around a stump or two? Anybody? Nobody, right? We don't care about them. How many, how many of you have a collection of stumps that you like to show to people? None of you. This, we don't care about stumps because they simply represent what was what isn't and what can't be anymore. We lived in Hattiesburg when Hurricane Katrina came through, and if you were in South Mississippi when Hurricane Katrina came through, the 100-mile-an-hour winds meant that everybody lost trees in their yard. And here's what happened. As soon as the trees got cut up and taken away, the next thing we did was what? We got rid of the stumps. We had them picked up, pulled up, or ground up. We got rid of the stumps because stumps don't matter anymore. All they do is give us a sign of what has died. And when Isaiah talks about a stump in the 11th chapter that we just read a second ago, that's what he's talking about. That's the image that he wants the people to have. A stump is simply something that represents what is dead, what is gone, what can be no more, a future that's been cut off. When Isaiah talks about a stump, he uses it as a very particular and specific sign, a very particular metaphor. This is what he talks about in Isaiah chapter 11. He talks about the stump of Jesse. Now, that's a strange thing to talk about, right? The stump of Jesse. He's not talking about a stump in Jesse's yard. That's not what he's talking about. You have to ask the right question. Who was Jesse? Turn to somebody beside you, and you can either tell them who Jesse is, or you can say, I got no idea where Eddie is right now, right? Here's who Jesse is. Jesse was the father of King David. And in the Old Testament, King David was the king of Israel. He is the king that all other kings were measured against. King David, even with his mistakes and his failures, was the one that God said, he's the one. He's the chosen. And for 400 years... For, four, for 20 generations, the line of David led Israel and then led the nation of Judah. 400 years, the sons and grandsons and great-grandsons led Israel. But what Isaiah tells the people here is what they already know, that the line of David is over. Just like a stump, it's been cut off. It is no more. There is no more future to it. And here's the problem with that. Here's what the people understand about this particular stump, that the line of David is no more. They also knew that the nation of Judah would rise and fall according to King David and his descendants. So if the line of David is no more, then what Isaiah is basically telling the people by talking about the stump of Jesse There's no more future to the nation of Judah. It's over. Can you imagine hearing that message? But here's the thing. The people of Judah knew that. They could feel it in their bones. The nation of Judah had been at war for 40 years. Can you imagine? You would would have been raising your grandchildren in the war that you started fighting. There was chaos and there was turmoil. There was absolutely no peace. This was the world. This was the only world that they knew. And so when Isaiah talks about this stump, the end of the future, the people would have nodded and said, yeah, we see that. We're tired of fighting the war. We can see that our nation is coming to an end. But here's the interesting thing. Even though they could see the stump, God gives Isaiah a new word. Here's what God speaks to Isaiah, that Isaiah speaks to the people about that stump. 
A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Here's, here's what Isaiah begins to realize. Here's what God teaches him, and he tells the people. God is going to do a new thing. God isn't going to take the tree and put it back on the stump. Instead, what God is going to do is God is going to birth something brand new. God is going to bring life out of death. God is going to bring an incredible redemption and recovery, not just for the line of David, but for God's people as well. And according to Isaiah, that's going to come through a person, a king, a new king, a very different king. This king is going to pay attention to the needs of the poor. This king is going to let the meek be heard. This person is going to put an end to the plans of all of the evil people. And here's how it's going to work out when you get to verse 6. We begin to get this picture, this image of this brand new kingdom. The way the kingdom is going to work, peace is going to break out. Can you imagine if you had known nothing but war for 40 years and suddenly you get this vision of peace, what it would do to your soul, the hope that might arise in you? What's going to happen, Isaiah says, is all of the predators and all the prey will come together. Hostilities will end. There will be no more evil in the kingdom of this new king. What Isaiah does is he paints this beautiful kingdom about wolves lying down with the lamb, leopards lying down with the kids, calf and lion and the fatling all together that kids could reach their hands out to snakes and the snakes won't even bother to bite them. That's the picture that Isaiah paints. What do you think about that? If you're like me, you probably think, you know, Eddie, that's a pretty picture. That's, that's a great vision but it's not realistic, is it? Isaiah spoke some 25, 2,600 years ago about this kind of peace breaking into our world. And what do we know? What do we see every day? We see brokenness. We see hurts. We see people hurting one another. We see the deep divisions, the political, religious divisions in our world. We see people betraying other people all the time. Where is this peace? It's a nice vision, we might think. But it's not rational. It's not logical. But here's what Isaiah does for us. Isaiah invites us to understand faith in a different way. And what Isaiah invites us to understand is that faith is neither logical nor illogical. Instead, faith is theological. What does theological mean? The word theos means God. Uh, what it means is that our faith understands that God is still writing this story. Our, our faith means that we understand that God is still alive and at work, that our God is not defeated, that your God is not defeated. Isaiah invites us into a world where we understand that God is continuing to dream the dreams of a new world and a new life for us. And here's how we know that. I want to, want to show you in the passage how we know that. And here it is. Something that you probably did not notice in the passage is that 19 times, 19 times in 10 verses, Isaiah uses the word shall or will. God will do this. This shall come to pass. This is going to happen. Isaiah relentlessly points to God's future. In Isaiah's mind, what he's inviting us into is an understanding of the world where God is not done. It's not just that we see and understand the past. It's not just that we see and understand the present. The invitation is to see the power of God's future. That God is still at work to trust and believe that the promise of God is more powerful than the present darkness. What God will do is more powerful than any dead stump we might see. And here's why we need this word. Here's why we need to be invited. Here's why we need to live in this world, not of the past or the present, but of God's future because the world is hard, isn't it? Maybe we haven't fought a war for 40 years. Maybe our children haven't grown up in that chaos. 
But we live in a world where we experience the brokenness, where we see the stumps in our own lives, where we see these moments in these places in our lives that just seem dead and broken beyond repair. We see these moments where there doesn't seem to be any sort of future in our lives. We hear about the war in Ukraine. We hear about those divisions we talked about a moment ago. And what begins to happen to us is we hear the whispers of the world. The whispers that say, you know what, this is just the way the world is is the world is angry if you're going to survive in it you got to be angry too we we hear the whispers that say your pain will never go away so you have to live in the cage of your grief we hear the whispers of the world say you know what you're an addict you'll never be well you'll never be whole just live in that we live in this world where we hear the whispers that this is all that there is, so go spend, buy, get all that you can get. So often we don't live in the dreams of God. Many, many of you may be familiar with a guy named C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was one of the great Christian writers of the 20th century. He wrote uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote Mere Christianity. But what you may not know about C.S. Lewis is that for most of his early life, he was an atheist. When he was a young child, his mother died of cancer, and he could not reconcile a good God uh, in the pain of losing his mother. Then he watched a lot of his friends go off and fight in World War I. Many of them didn't come home. The rest of them who did come home were broken beyond belief. And he could not understand a God who, allow, who would allow that kind of suffering to happen. So he walked away from God altogether. But one of his friends later in life was a guy named J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, Tolkien wrote The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And Tolkien was a Christian. So for years, uh, Tolkien and Lewis would get together and have these conversations about faith and God and Jesus. And C.S. Lewis would throw up objection after objection. And, and Tolkien would walk him through it. And he would take the objections and they'd come back and talk some more. On the night before C.S. Lewis finally gave his life over to Christ, J.R.R. Tolkien told him something profound. This is what he told his friend C.S. Lewis your inability to understand stems from a failure of imagination on your part. A failure of imagination. What if you heard Isaiah today inviting you to dream again, inviting you to imagine not just what you want, but to trust in the imagination of God again Maybe to believe this, that the promise of God is more powerful than this present darkness. The season of Advent, all the season of Advent is, is an invitation to trust in the imagination of God. These weeks where we wait on Jesus, we wait on Jesus because what we do is we learn about this God who is willing in great love and grace and mercy to come to us in the flesh, to walk among us, to show us and to reveal his great love for us. That we might be made new, made whole, that we might be set free. When we gather on Christmas Eve to raise our candles in the darkness, it's simply a moment where we claim the dreams of God, that light cannot be put out by the darkness. And that's why every year we call you to wait again so that our minds and our souls might be healed, that we might see and know that it's not just what we see and hear now that matters. But we can claim again, we can lean into the imagination of God. In March of 1863, guy named Charles Appleton Wadsworth, Longfellow, Charles Appleton uh, Longfellow, got on a train and traveled 400 miles south uh, to join Lincoln's army to fight the Confederacy. And he did it against his father's wishes. His father was the poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And here's why his dad did not want him to go fight, because 18 months before, uh, they had lost his wife. 
and Charlie's mother, and he could not imagine the pain of losing another family member, particularly not in this war against the South. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow got a telegram on December 1st of that year that his son Charlie had been wounded uh, in a battle, gravely wounded, and was going to be sent to a hospital in Washington, D.C. So Henry Wadsworth Longfellow made his way to D.C. He actually got there before his son got there. Uh, When Charlie got there, he underwent several surgeries. Uh, He would live, but he would face a long and painful recovery. Longfellow stayed there in D.C. with his son through Christmas. And on Christmas Day, he was awakened to the sound of these joyous, glorious bells. That wasn't where his heart was. His heart was still grieving his wife, still struggling to understand why his son was so grievously injured. He struggled to make sense of his life because he saw the stumps and the glory of the Christmas bells. So he sat down and wrote a poem. You heard Adam sing it a minute ago. It starts out, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. It's not just this glorious song, hymn, carol of Christmas. He walks us through all of his emotion, all of his struggle with the bells of Christmas Day. The next to last verse says this, And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth goodwill to men. Longfellow saw the brokenness, the stump, the end, the loss of future. That was his life in the moment. And he had to decide, would he live there with his past and his present? Or would he lean into the future, the imagination of God? And here's the last verse of the song, of the poem. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. Maybe for you, this Advent season, maybe it's time to claim the words will and shall again. God will, God shall. Maybe it's time for you to claim once again the invitation of Isaiah to believe that the promise of God is more powerful than your present darkness. Maybe it's time for you to hear again the great good news of a God whose love for you is so strong that even in moments of death is working for you new life and new beginning. And the sign and the symbol of that is the Christ who comes to us. So let me pray for you and for me that in this world that gives us plenty of stumps, we might claim again the imagination of our God, that God will and God shall. Let's pray. God, it is so easy to get trapped, to be held by the endings and the brokenness, to be held by the anger chaos and the confusion of our world. It's easy to forget, God, that you will, that you shall, that your future is still to come. God, there's so many struggle in this season to hear the glorious bells they feel the despair and the darkness of life God you are a God who continues to dream may we hold on with faith that your promises of the future are more powerful than anything we face right now In the name of the coming Christ, we pray. Amen.